Hi everyone, my name is Sergey, and this is my colleague Shin. And we work at Facebook in Spark team, and today we would like to share our experience on supporting over a thousand custom Hive user-defined functions in Spark. So in this talk, uh, we'll first uh, give a brief introduction into user-defined functions, uh, what they are, how they work. We'll also give uh, insights into how the Hive EDFs are used in Facebook. Then we'll uh, dive into major challenges and improvements on the way to support 99% of the UDFs at Facebook. And later on, Shin will dive deeper into aggregate functions and specifically into partial aggregations. So what are user-defined functions? Well, actually, in Hive, there is no difference between like, uh, built-in well, like regular functions and user-defined functions. And UDFs are used to add some custom code logic if built-in or existing uh, functions cannot achieve desired result. Like in this simple select query, you can see um, yeah, there are two user-defined functions over here, or well, two functions over here. The first one is substring, which is just a regular uh, UDF, and the second one is count, which is an aggregate function. Uh, let's talk through the types of different Hive functions. So uh, the first and the most uh, popular, popular one used is uh, just regular user-defined functions. Uh, they work on a single row in a table, and for one or more inputs from the row, they produce a single output. So it's always one-to-one -one mapping between one row and to the output. Uh, the second type is user-defined table functions, and for every row in a table, they can return multiple values. So it's not, it can be that one row can produce three, three rows, and etc. And the last type is user-defined aggregate functions, and these functions work on one or more rows, and uh, they, they produce a single output for, for those rows. Just to give you some simple examples, so here we have a simple table with two columns, array one and array two, and we have a query which uses a custom user-defined function, a array concat. This is a simple function, function which just uh, combines two arrays into a, in, into a single array. And since we have two rows over here, um, as, as an output, we will see uh, two rows, two rows uh, produced. Now, next type is uh, user-defined table function. And let's just consider a very simple example where we have only a single row with, uh, with, uh, with, with a column ID. And we have a query like this. So you can see over here that we select uh, the column ID, but we also select another column, which is not present in the table. And this column, the other column index is coming from the UDTF uh, stack. Uh, and stack is a commonly used UDTF. What it basically does, it can accept like a var variable number of arguments. And the first argument is the number of values that it's gonna produce. And then you have exactly that, that amount of uh, arguments. So here, the stack uh, UDTF is going to produce three values. And they are going to be paired with a single value of ID 1, 2, 3. And since we have only one row and three values produced, uh, as an output, we will see uh, three rows produced. And the last type is, is user-defined aggregate function. And let's consider another simple example with three rows. And the query which uses collect set uh, a user-defined aggregate function. So what it will do, it will combine uh, the, three, um, the three rows into a single, single array and will produce a single row as an output. So how do Hive UDFs work in Spark? And uh, the good thing is that most Hive data types, uh, including Java types and de derivatives of object inspector class, they can be converted to Sparks, uh, some Sparks and internal data types and vice versa. And in Hive, when we write uh, custom user-defined functions, we usually extend like the three major classes, generic UDF, simple generic UDF, and generic UDTF. And Spark basically calls this via wrapper classes, extending Spark's expression, imperative, aggregate, and generator. And these uh, internal types in Spark uh, have a very similar semantics to the ones of the Hive. Now let's take a look at one of those wrapper classes. Uh, here is, you can see a class uh, high generic UDF, and this is, uh, this is real code, but just like I removed some part of it. And this class, this wrapper class extends expression, and it, since it extends expression, it has to override eval method. So uh, you can see on line six that we have an instance of uh, Hive's UDF uh, created for in, inside of this wrapper. And inside of eval, it does some stuff, but uh, at the end of the day, what it does, it calls the Hive's UDF instances uh, evaluate method. And of course, uh, it does some additional wrapping and unwrapping between Hive and Spark types. 
Now let's uh, talk about the UDFs at Facebook and where they stand. So uh, as some of you might know, Hive was primarily, uh, the primary query engine until we started to migrate jobs to Spark and Presto. And actually, it's been like the main, main query engine for over seven years. And over the course of, of these years, uh, uh, we definitely had like, issues when like, existing user-defined functions couldn't satisfy the needs of our, of our data engineers, data scientists, and other software engineers. So we provided them with tools to write their own custom user-defined functions. And we actually ended up with like over 1,000 uh, custom UDFs built. And Hive queries that used UDFs accounted for over 70% of CPU time amongst all the queries. So supporting Hive UDFs in Spark was uh, very important uh, if you wanted to migrate successfully from Hive to Spark. So, uh, but first of all, we actually didn't, at the beginning of the migration, we didn't have a baseline of what is the level of support of UDFs in Spark. Because we migrated some of the pipelines, uh, some of them were failing, some of them were succeeding, and it wasn't quite clear like, how, many, like, how many UDFs we actually support. And uh, luckily, we already had some things to work with. So we already had an existing UDFs uh, testing framework, which was uh, which allowed us to run uh, tests against uh, Hive. So basically, when our customers were writing uh, custom user-defined functions, we encouraged them to provide some additional like, basic unit tests. And here you can see an annotation Hive unit tests, and which has two test cases. And each test case has a query and the expected result for that query. And basically, in Hive, uh, when we made some changes to Hive and we wanted to make sure that things work, um, as expected, we actually ran this like as part of automated testing. And the first thing we did for Spark is, of course, uh, to, to further, um, uh, to allow running queries against Spark rather than only for Hive. And the way we implemented this uh, was basically when, when we run tests uh, for user-defined functions, so we create a temporary Scala file for each UDF class, and it will contain code to run SQL queries using data, data frame API. And the SQL commands are taken from those annotations. And basically what the testing framework uh, later, later did was uh, spawning a separate Spark shell sub-process and runs this, uh, this Scala file basically against the Spark shell and producing some, some kind of command very similar to what you see on the screen. Then the output of the, uh, of the query would be parsed and compared to the expected results. And that's how we actually could identify some kind of a baseline of what we support and what we don't support in terms of Hive UDFs. And with test coverage in place, the baseline support of UDFs by query count and CPU days was identified, and it was actually pretty low. It was around 58% at the beginning. And later on, we, we identified like, the, the most important like, UDFs, because like, of course, out of those thousands of UDFs, uh, not all of them were actually used in production. And some of the cases had to be handled um, individually for some of the UDS, but for many of the UDS, we actually could use the test errors output as, as the basis to identify the common issues. And let me talk about those. So uh, uh, let's talk about these major challenges that we faced. So first of all, it's not a secret that uh, Spark, uh, including the latest open source Spark, uh, doesn't support all the APIs which are provided by high UDFs. And here's a list of all of them. And actually, at Facebook, we can live with uh, most of those not being supported because we don't, didn't really use them that much. But uh, the two uh, APIs, get required jars and get required files, were quite important for us and because they were used in a couple of dozen of UDFs. So what are those APIs doing? So basically, uh, these functions... Uh, automatically include additional resources required by the UDFs. And as a result, UDF code, uh, when, we, when it executes on the executor site, on the worker site, it can assume that file is present in the executor working directory. Now, here's a very simple example of a simple UDF which does something, and it provides a file uh, in get required files uh, method. And then, like you can see that in, uh, inside of evaluate method, which basically executes on, for every single row, uh, we have like a basic initial initialization of some mapping. And when this mapping is initialized, uh, executor is trying to read the file by the simple file name. And if the file is missing out there in the working directory of executor, 
Uh, this is gonna fail with file not found exception. So we had to work towards uh, supporting these uh, APIs because they were so important for us. And we actually have a Spark Jira ticket for this and uh, we plan to open source our like, implementation over there. So basically, uh, the good thing about HiveDFs is that like, they are initialized on the driver side. Um, they're always initialized on the driver side. Then they're being serialized with cryo, and uh, shipped to executors and deserialized on the executor side. So uh, whenever we have initialization of the UDFs uh, on the driver side, we can actually extract what are the required files and the required jars for those UDFs. And we can also add these uh, files and jars uh, using Spark uh, two methods, Spark context add, add file and Spark context add jar. Then executor uh, will actually fetch these files which were added to Spark context uh, from the driver. And Actually, like on the executor size side, we also have some kind of initialization process for each of the UDF. So we again actually can scan all of these UDFs and see like uh, what are the required files that are needed by, 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 by those UDFs. And if the files are already present in the working directory, we just do nothing because it means that they were successfully distributed from the driver. If the files are still missing uh, in the working directory, we will try to create a symbolic link uh, pointing to the absolute path location. And why do we need the letter? Uh, well, actually, like, if we have like, pretty large files required by the UDFs, uh, it's, it's gonna put a lot of burden on the, on the drivers because like, each executor is gonna download the big file from the driver. So for very big files, we actually try to ship them in a different way. So something like let them be part of the image of the part of the image of the system like where the executors are running. So, so that these files are present in the absolute path. Another big uh, challenge that we faced was UDFs and stress safety. And basically, a uh, majority of the UDFs, when they were written uh, by our Hive users, uh, they didn't take into account the concurrency. and didn't have concurrency in mind at all. And the reason is that because uh, Hive and Spark have very different semantics when it comes to running tasks. Well, Hive run tasks in a separate GPM process per each task. In Spark, we, uh, we have executors uh, which can run multiple tasks concurrently on, on the same GPM. And it means that, uh, let's say we have an executor and you have two tasks running, and each task is processing its portion of the rows. Uh, if you have a UDF, uh, this, uh, each of the tasks will have its own instance of a UDF. And so it means we cannot have these UDFs be, to be stateful, and otherwise we can face some data corruption issues. Here is a very simple example of, thread and, of a thread and safe UDF. And here you can see that uh, uh, there is kind of mapping initialization, and on the line number two, we can see that there is a static map. And what it means that is that this object is gonna be shared between different instances of, of this class. Uh, now let's consider that we have two tasks and hence two instances of UDF, instance one and instance two. So evaluate method is called for each row. Both of the instances could, and, and when, when, it, when this method is called, both of the instances could pass the null check inside evaluate method at the same time. So once instance one finishes initialization first, it will call evaluate for the next row. And here's what can happen. If instance two is still in the middle of initialization in, of the mapping, it could override the data that instance one relies on, which can result in data corruption or like not finding some of the keys in the mapping. Well, how do we uh, fix this? Well, there are different approaches. So one of them is introduce synchronization or like locking. And basically in, in this example, we refactored this UDF uh, to, to have synchronization, synchronization on the class itself. And yeah, this will actually work just fine. But there are drawbacks of this approach because synchronization is actually computationally expensive. And for UDS, which can be executed on billions of rows, if you actually do like locking on every single row, this is gonna bring a lot of overhead. And this also requires manual and accurate refactoring of the code uh, because, and this actually doesn't scale if you have like hundreds of such UDS. Another approach is uh, make fields non-static. Like in this case, we can just uh, remove the static uh, and this is gonna turn into an instance variable. Well, uh, the disadvantage of this is that we cannot actually have a shared state between different instances and it can put more memory pressure. Uh, but it might, maybe it's okay because like, uh, there are pros, um, like advantages of this approach in terms of 
minimal change in the code, and this can also be code modded for all other EDFs that use static fields of non on non-primitive types. The next big issue that we faced was the cryo serialization serialization. So basically, as I told before, uh, UDFs in Spark are initialized on the driver side. They are being serialized with cryo, shipped to executors and deserialized uh, with cryo again. And some classes uh, cannot be deserialized out of the box or maybe serialized out of the box. And one of the examples is, let's say, Guava's immutable set. So cryo can actually successfully serialize it, the objects on the driver, but will fail to deserialize it on the executor side due to immutable, immutability of the objects. So how can we solve this issue? So first of all, we can actually catch these survey issues by running high UDF tests in cluster mode rather than in local mode. So this will actually trigger the actual like, serialization utilization process. And for commonly used classes, we can write custom or import existing serializers. Like even for the Guava, there are actually existing uh, serializers, cryo serializers uh, living in the open source. And as a last resort, we can always mark the problematic static, um, um, problematic instance variables as transient. So uh, this will avoid their serialization on the driver, and they will be reinitialized when they, uh, when they are used on the, the executor side. And last but not least, uh, Hive UDF's performance is actually a, a major issue for us. So as you might know, that Hive UDFs don't support data types from Spark out of the box. And similarly, Spark cannot work with Hive's object inspectors. And so for each UDF call, uh, what Spark does, uh, Spark's data types are wrapped into Hive's inspectors and Java types. And same is happening for the results. So basically, if you have as a result some Java types or like some object inspectors, we have to convert it back into the type which is understandable by Spark. Uh, let's take a look again at uh, one of the wrapper classes. Uh, this is a wrapper class for the uh, UDF, UDF, like which is very uh, simple and basic type of class, um, and it's actually deprecated, but like it's just good to see like how things are being uh, are working over here. So you can see in the eval method over here that uh, all the inputs uh, when they are evaluated, like per row, uh, we actually have to wrap them into the types which are understandable by this UDF, and then the there is a, a reflection call uh, of the of some method, uh, like of some maybe it's evaluate method and which, which passes this wrapped, uh, wrapped parameters. And then when we have the result, uh, we have to unwrap it back so that uh, Spark could actually understand it. And this wrapping and wrapping overhead can lead up to 2x of CPU time spent in UDF compared to a Spark native implementation. And UDFs that work with complex types like maps, arrays, and structs actually suffer the most from this. Uh, so, and actually this is a big issue for us and we are still uh, trying to solve this. And because UDFs are, account for 15% of CPU uh, spent for Spark queries. And this is actually huge like, in, term, in terms of like entire Facebook data warehouse. And the most computation, so how we solve it right now is we try to identify the most computationally expensive UDFs and, so that, and especially those which are the mostly used and we try to convert them into native implementation in Spark and also like, take advantage of the code gen version of, of the UDFs. Uh, next, I'll hand it over to Shin to talk about uh, user-defined aggregate functions and specifically about uh, partial aggregations. Okay, thank you, Sergey. So before I start, show of hands, how many of you know what is Spark aggregation? Okay, so how about uh, partial aggregation? Okay. Okay, quite a few. So today, uh, my name is Xin. So today I'll be talking about uh, aggregation, partial aggregation in UDF. So what is aggregation, first of all? So aggregation is a fundamental uh, feature of a SQL engine. So uh, aggregation functions like maximum, minimum, uh, average, and so on are really important for a SQL query. So it is fair to say that a query, uh, you can't write a, a reasonably complex SQL query without aggregate function. So here we have a retrieval aggregation function. What it does is getting the maximum value for every ID. So how will Spark execute this uh, SQL query? So first here, all the data flows from left to right, from mapper to reducer. So let's say we, this table has two files. So Spark will launch two mappers, each of which will read one file. And later, Spark will shuffle the data from mapper to reducer through network in a way that 
every the same uh, same key will always go to the same reducer. So once reducer have the same keys for us, uh, all the rows of the same same keys, it will do a local local final aggregation to get a final result final aggregation result for each row. Here we can tell that we got a result that we have maximum 300 for key one and 100 for key three. So then uh, we got a right result. So what is the problem? So here. Uh, in order to do the aggregation, we Spark need to bring every, every row for same key to the, to the same uh, reducer. So every single row needs to be shuffled through network, which in general, most of the cases is a very heavy uh, operation. And also we, ha we might have data skill uh, and also the data imbalance problem, which are that because we need to bring the same, same key to the same reducer. So if one key has significantly more rows than others, so the reducer that processes this key will take longer time to run. And we also will be risk in the OOM um problem. So here we have the partial aggression. So what is partial aggression? Partial aggression is a technique that a system can partially aggregate the data in mapper side before shuffle. So in order to reduce the shuffle size. So here we take a look at the same query, aggregation query we run before. So with, without partial aggression, we uh, just shuffle everything from mapper to reducer. So what will happen when we have partial aggression? So SPA will ha also have the same uh, launch two mappers for those two files. But before the shuffle, uh, in the mapper side, SPA will actually do a partial aggregation, which will aggregate the data locally in each mapper, trying to reduce the number of rows to shuffle. Here, in the mapper one, we have for, you can see for ID one, we have two rows, so SPA can aggregate them into one row to get partial max, which is 200. And the similar thing happens in uh, mapper, mapper 2. Then Spark will shuffle the partial results from mapper to reducer. And also in the same way that the same, same key always go to the same, uh, same reducer. Then once we have the, all the same rows for the same key in the same reducer, Spark will run the local uh, final aggregation in each uh, reducer to get the final result. Here, as we can see, we have the exact same result as we have before. So here is the simple comparison between uh, aggregation and partial aggregation. So for shuffle data size uh, with only aggregation, we need to shuffle every single row from mapper to reducer. But with partial aggregation enabled, we are shuffling in reduced number of rows. So for computation, all the aggregation actually happens in reducer side with only aggregation. But when, when we have the partial aggregation, actually the, the, uh, uh, the aggregation happens both in mapper side and reducer side. So there's a distribution across mapper and reducer. So here, so why, so with that, why are partial aggregation important? Because it actually impacts the CPU and shuffle, shuffle data size. And also it could help with the data skill. So what we did in, in Facebook, so partial aggregation support for UDF is already there in the open source world. So, but in, Spark, in, in uh, Facebook, we have so many different UDFs and some of, the, some of them are really complex. So we had to fix some, some issues to make it work for uh, Facebook uh, UDFs. So once we uh, have everything, we rolled out to production. So what's the result, what's the exciting result? So partial aggregation actually improves CPU by 20% for, and also we re reduce the shuffle data size by 17% for, for all the queries that actually benefit from the partial aggregation. But that's always a but. However, we also observed some heavy pipelines request as much as 300. So what could go wrong? So there are two major reasons that could go wrong in this, in this uh, in, in scenario. One is the query shape, basically what does the query looks like. The, the second one is the data distribution. How is the data distributed across different files? So let's take a look, look at them one by one. For, for the query shape, the major reason is that it's called uh, column expansion. What it is that for partial aggregation actually gonna expand the number of columns at a mapper side. So it might result in a larger shuffle data size. So let's take a look at this uh, simple aggregation query. So what it does is trying to get a maximum value, minimum value, count of the count of value, average value for each uh, for each key. So how will uh, Spark execute, uh, execute this query differently with aggregation uh, and uh, only with the, and with the partial aggregation? So here with only aggregation, Spark gonna uh, launch a mapper for each file 
and I'm gonna shuffle these two columns from mapper to reducer. So how about with partial aggression? So for the same, uh, for the same query with partial aggression, Spark actually need to run the partial aggression at the mapper side, which gonna result in a five columns uh, as a partial result. Here, instead of shuffling two columns, Spark will have to shuffle five columns, which is not optimal for this case. Uh, so next reason, major reason that partial aggression might not work is called data distribution. So if the data is now in our favor, which means that there's no rows or only a little rows for us to aggregate as a mapper side, so we need to pay, like, pay toes for this and without getting, without getting anything. So let's take a look at this simple query we saw before, which is getting the maximum value for each key. So with only aggregation, so we shuffle four rows here from mapper to reducer. So with partial aggregation enabled, we run partial aggregation. Actually, the partial results no different than the input because every single ID are identical. There's no rows for us to aggregate. So we, we actually need to pay extra CPUs to run the partial aggression without any row reduction in this use case. So how did we solve the problem? So we used the cost-based optimization to try to solve this problem. So before we talk about uh, cost-based uh, uh, optimization, so here are the three cost computational cost factors for, aggregation, for partial aggression. So first, if, uh, in order to run partial aggregation, we need to run, pay extra CPUs in the mapper side to run a, a partial aggregation. And the second is the column uh, expansion. So last is the row reduction ratio. So we implement a, a computational cost-based optimizer for partial aggregation. Basically, we use multiple features to calculate the computational cost of partial aggregation. Some of the uh, features we use here is the input column numbers, the output column number, and what's the computation cost of a partial aggregation, uh, so, and so on. So when we get the, once we get the cost, we're gonna use that to decide if we want to enable partial aggregation or not for this particular query. So we uh, tested and rolled it out to production, so it did improve the efficiency over the board. But however, there's still some queries that we don't have the most optimized partial aggregation configurations for them. Why? Because uh, there, as we talk, we are, there are three major cost factors for partial aggression. So co uh, cost-based optimizer actually could cover the first two, um, but for the row reduction, it's really hard for cost-based optimizer to cover. It's because the data actually might be different from, from day to day. Each data site is different, even for the same query. And even for the same data site, if you run different queries with different group, group by keys, the row reduction could also be different. So this is the work we are still working on. So the future work for this is that we are going to use history-based tuning for partial aggression. So history, what, what is history-based tuning is that since in Facebook, we have so many repetitive cores running every day, so we are going to collect all the metrics of them and use those history data for us to predict what's the best configuration for the next run. And this is perfect for partial aggression because the history-based tuning operates at query level, so we, we could get the best optimized configuration for each and every query. So here's the simple recap. So, uh, so again, start with uh, talk about what is UDF and uh, what we did to make UDF work to support a hundred uh, thousand of different UDFs in uh, uh, Facebook. And I talk about the aggregation, the partial aggregation, and the work we did to make uh, partial work in Facebook and uh, the future work of us. So with that, we are ready to take questions. Yes. Could you ask uh, to, yeah, could you please ask in the microphones? So do you guys ever write UDFs in Python? And if so, how do you like manage interoperability between like writing Scala and then the people using Python? 
Uh, so the, you're asking about the writing media apps in Python, right? Yep. Yep. And uh, actually, like um, at, at, at Facebook, we don't really like write uh, Python. We don't really support it right now. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about UDFs, it's a bit different context. So, like the UDFs, which are like, let's say you can just register this as a temporary function, uh, it's a bit different types of UDFs, honestly. So, here we are speaking more about uh, Hive user defined functions. So, basically, which have like a, some release process, separate, uh, separate classes for them, and we pick them up. Okay. And uh, otherwise, like, uh, if you want to write like the native Spark native UDFs, so we are writing them using Scala. Makes sense. All right, thank you. Question regarding the partial aggregation. Mm -hmm. How is it similar or different to the combiners that are applicable to the MapReduce? Uh, sir, can you repeat the question? How is partial aggregation similar or different to the combiner stage? In the oh, MapReduce? so the question is that what's the uh, difference and the similarity between partial aggregation and the combiner, right? Yes. So I think combiner is concept in MapReduce, right? If I, if I remember correctly. So True, I but it does something similar at the map stage like what you said, to reduce the shuffle. Okay, so conceptually, they are the same thing, just you want to combine data in the mapper side before you shuffle them from mapper to reducer, hoping to reduce the number of the rows you need to shuffle. Okay, Does that, that answer sense. your question? So it's conceptually the same thing. Yeah, conceptually they are similar. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, can you explain more about how you do the history-based tuning and whether the tools you're using are open source? Uh, you're asking how do we uh, optimize the partial regression? Or? Yeah, or just in general, um, doing history-based tuning for Hive or Spark queries. Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. So history-based tuning actually is a work we are still working on right now. And I think we, are, we have planned to open source them. If, and uh, yeah. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, you guys mentioned that you have tools for uh, users to build uh, their own UDFs. Uh, I'm just kind of curious what that pipeline looks like for you guys. Are they um, uh, like importing uh, libraries that you have and building kind of within a framework and shipping them off to you for review, or is like can they have an idea, uh, build it, and have it implemented like as soon as they're done with it? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, actually, it really depends on the use case. But for majority of the UDFs, uh, they are being written like like of Hive UDFs, they're written in a single library. And uh, with this library, we just try to shade and relocate all the dependencies, the drone dependencies. And then these jars is gonna be added in runtime. So the reason we do this is because like, the same library is actually being picked up both by Hive and by Spark, because we are still not fully migrated from Hive to Spark. And we don't wanna like, mess up with the dependencies so that like, there are any runtime issues. So shading and relocation really helps with that for us. I think you, you talk about uh, col or colon expansion, mm -hmm. and um, uh, you know for for the UDAF, mm -hmm. uh, you said that there's a need to change configuration. Then what configuration parameters uh, did you change? Uh, so the question is that how do we control the partial regression? So yeah. which configuration do we use? Yeah, is that question? Yes. Oh, actually we uh, uh, I think in open source you can't actually disable partial aggression. And uh, I think we added that functionality to uh, its uh, configuration. We can set it to control if we want to enable partial aggression for UDF and also for agri uh, partial aggression in general. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Hi, uh, you, guys you guys talked about partial aggregation and mm -hmm. That's a great technique for uh, functions such as max, min. These aggregators can be sharded and they can work on sharded data, right? And then you can combine them at the end. I was wondering if you guys have thought of uh, optimizations on functions such as median, which cannot work on divided data. You really need the full data set to compute a median. Uh, so I, I don't get the question. So you're asking, so can, can So, so if I, if, if I uh, go back to the example you took, uh, you had uh, you used in your example max function, right? Mm -hmm. max, so max you function. can you can divide the data into multiple pieces, compute the max for each of them, and then finally combine them in the reducer stage, right? So you're asking we we can divide the data into pieces. So what what I'm asking is there are certain class of functions such as median, which require the entire data set. You can't you can't divide the data and compute median in each of the sets and then combine them. The results won't be the same. I was wondering if you guys have thought of any optimizations over there. 
yeah, some of the user defined aggregate functions, um, they cannot actually leverage this partial aggregation in this case. Oh, you're because asking. The, like okay. the median, you cannot compute median. OK, like, I got it. So you're asking that if, if every, every function could actually benefit from partial aggregation, is that your question? So actually, not every uh, UDF actually you can run the partial aggregation. And uh, some of them, if you can, even if you, want, you can run them, it's not much benefit you can get from them. I can give you an example, which is the um, get list, which is that if you want to aggregate the data into a list, doing so in mapper side actually wouldn't give you much benefit because you are actually going to put all the data into a large list in mapper side and shuffle them to reducer. So you are not getting much benefit from them, but also need to pay actual CPU for them. Right. So does that sure. make sense? Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Uh, regarding the reduction size estimation, have you mm -hmm. ever think of running, uh, running the UDEF mm -hmm. on a sample size to get an uh, estimate about the size reduction? Oh, that's a good question. So actually, we uh, thought about that. But in order to run that, you need to pay extra CPU to get the, I mean, the statistics of this data, right? So that's one way. And it's the, another way is the history-based tuning, right? Because we are already running the repetitive query over and over again for uh, history data. And there's a lot of data for us to use for them. So it's kind of we already have those data for history query. And using that to predict the future configuration for that, I think, is better than pay extra CPU yeah. to get the aesthetics of the data. Um, but so. for mm -hmm. the history-based estimation, mm -hmm. uh, we may have to save the historical statistics, right? We need to. Uh, we need yeah, to we also need to store those. It's more like, do you want to run the analyze for the for the data you haven't run query over, or? We already have the data for history data, so we can use them to predict. Okay. Make sense? OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, we probably have time for one last question. Uh, it could be too complicated to explain in a short amount of time, but I'm curious how you guys choose to store and register your UDFs. I know you can register them like with any kind of Hive database, but sometimes we have uh, user confusion around where UDFs are associated. So curious if you guys have a preferred solution for that. I'm sorry, I didn't really get this. I... Uh, like so you can store UDFs like locally on like an edge node or in HDFS and then okay. build the symbolic link to the Hive function like to where the jar lives. Just curious if you guys have a preferred method for doing that. Do you deploy them all in HDFS and link them to the default Hive database, or is that too confusing a uh, question? I see. Yeah. Yeah. So in our use case, we mostly kind of like we use the UDS, not the ones which are actually like registered on MetaStore or maybe so stored somewhere else. So they're just those which are provided in runtime uh, to the engine. So yeah, that's a bit different use case for us. Oh, okay. But we, we we can maybe talk offline about this because like I think yeah. like. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions, speakers will be available in the back of the room. Um, and uh, we would love to hear about your feedback. So please download Apache uh, Spark AI Summit app, and you can rate and review this session. Uh, with that, please give a round of applause to Speaker Sergey and Shay. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>